Dr Abrahams. A warm welcome to all viewers and subscribers, new and existing. Also apologies, I, like Ross, am stuffed up and sneezing. The clip Ross showed in BHH number 80 fairly caught my eye, as may be expected, and I was turning over some thoughts when Lawrence Kay asked if I had seen the University of Leicester's short video, and if so, what I had thought of it. I duly watched it and decided to throw my thoughts on this stunning find out there for your consideration. So thank you, Lawrence, for taking the trouble to send me the link and for giving me the inspiration for this short video. I am not an art historian, but I don't think one needs to be to see from the outset that the style of this is quite different from Roman mosaics from the same era that this villa is said to be, about 3rd or 4th century AD. The Roman style is sinuous, flowing, detailed, natural-looking, and, it has to be said, rather passive, even static. The British mosaic, by contrast, is vigorous, masculine and stylized, even archaic, rather crude, perhaps, but pulsing with energy. The contrast is particularly noticeable between the Roman horses and the Trojan horses. Incidentally, while researching the illustrations for this video, I found pictures of this threefold mosaic literally everywhere on web images under Roman mosaics. The horses also have a definitely Egyptian feel to them. This is a comparison with horses on the carving um, of the Battle of Kadesh, um, I think this is on the Ramesseum in, in, in um, Italy, dear heavens, Egypt. This battle took place, they say, in 1274 BC, or if one applies Wilson and Blackett's revised chronology, about 674 BC. This is about half a millennium after the First Trojan War, which took place roughly 12, 1200 BC. And it's before Roman, uh, Rome had even be been established, so this mosaic is definitely not Roman. The fellow at the top also has a distinctly Egyptian feel to him, since he is weighing what is presumably Hector's dead body against something un unidentifiable, perhaps a stone or a weight of metal. Most people will be familiar with the Egyptian concept of mayat, a kind of combination of truth, balance, order, harmony, law, morality and justice. Mayat weighed the heart of the deceased against a feather to determine the sort of afterlife the deceased would experience. I haven't yet found an equivalent for Mayat in either Welsh, Sumerian or Akkadian, but I'll keep looking. And is that a British cross we can see on the left, in the bottom third, under the red shield? Finally, look at their eyes. These are disproportionately bright, especially in the fellow next to the British cross. Wherever the British, the watchers, the clear-sighted ones, went in the world, they left behind them depictions of themselves, notable for their bright eyes. We're increasingly finding that we taught the Romans everything they know, and they have forgotten to whom that they owe this knowledge. We taught them how to deal with sewage, for example. The Cloaca Maxima was constructed in Rome by Brutus's uncle and is still in use today. We taught them how to pave roads, and this is provable. Why should we not also have taught them the art of making pictures in mosaic? The word mosaic is from muse, so we are back to the Arwen again and the tiny individual twinkling human lights that make up the great picture, like the stars in the sky. Consider this Welsh-British word, so obviously connected to British that I need hardly to say it. Rutland is a tiny country. A oh, warning, there's a digression approaching. Uh, if we can have the name and borders of Rutland back, we can take back Westmoreland, Cumberland, Lancashire and the three ridings of Yorkshire, not to mention all the other counties and county boundaries mangled in the mid-1970s. For information on how you can help Pam Morehouse in her campaign to restore Britain's counties, please see the link below. Since the whereabouts in Rutland of this Trojan villa are being kept secret, why and from whom? From us, perhaps? I have calculated the distance from Oakham to the Gog Magog Hills, where Troy once stood, at about 70 miles, if you're a crow. I think that this majestic piece of British art is a memorial to the catastrophic war that took place on the Cambridgeshire Plains to the east of the Gog Magog Hills in about 1200 B BC. That's BC, by the way, not BBC. I'll stick my neck out further and say that the villa it adorns was built by a descendant of a Trojan who fought here and defended royal and towery Troy. And Rutland, could that be red land by any chance? The same red that is the flowing blood colour of Logos or England?
But we want proof, I hear you cry, and proof you shall have. Consider this by Homer in the Iliad. Two fair springs which feed the river Scamandros, oh, and Iman Wilkins, who wrote where Troy once stood, identifies the cam, also called the Re, as Scamandros. One of these two springs is warm, and steam rises from it as smoke from a burning fire, but the other, even in summer, is as cold as hail or snow, or the ice that forms on water. Here, hard by the springs, are the goodly washing troughs of stone. <coughs> where in the time of peace, before the coming of the Kians, <coughs> the wives and fair sorry <coughs> the wives and fair daughters of the Trojans used to wash their clothes. Cold springs can be found anywhere in this country, uh, especially in summer it would seem. Hot springs are more difficult to come by. Wilkins says that the presence of a hot spring Anywhere near here, the Gogmagog Hills, would serve as concrete proof that Troy had once existed nearby. I searched like a mad thing for hot springs in East Anglia and found nothing. Then I searched for warm springs in East Anglia and found this. This is an extract from my forthcoming book, The Great Migrations to Britain, in 1567 BC and 509 BC. The idea that the plains of Troy in Cambridgeshire either were already or became their capital city is strengthened when we look at the names of the rivers on the plain below the Gogmagog Hills, particularly the River Cam itself, which runs roughly south to north to the west of the Gogmagog Hills. Wilkins identifies it as the famous Scamander. Little and Scott give Scamandros as deriving from the same root as Scambos, meaning crooked or bent of the legs. <clears throat> and we'll come back to this. And they actually add that scambos was originally campto or campsos with s prefixed. A kimbo used of arms bent with hands on hips is also connected, although it is given in the online etymology dictionary of no no as being of no known origin. Skeet at least acknowledges the cur curved element. A more graphic description of the arrival and settling of a migration of the Cymric Sumeric people could hardly have been dreamt up. If you've seen my video, The Lame Smith, this concept will not come as a surprise to you. Until the next time, thank you for your company. You are an amazing lot of thoughtful and intelligent people. <laughs>